All right, welcome to the last lecture of this semester. It's going to be a little bit goofy. I'm just going to warn you now, so at any point you want to fast forward, feel free. But uh, Maddie and Derek are going to be helping uh, record today. And uh, so uh, let, me, let me turn the camera to get more on these gentlemen. These are my Vanna White assistants. Well, they're not going to get in the shot until I tell them to. So there we go. There they are. Okay. So today, gentlemen at the board, we're talking about vision and movement, and we're going to talk about having a vision for your city. So we talked about um, building foundations, and then we're now uh, just going to talk about planting the phases. And you see the little hashtag here. You might want to take a gander or guess at what that means. Extremely man, man, and women content? No, it stands for every man, woman, and child. I knew that. Okay, so every man, woman, and child. And uh, will you please erase the contents? We can go to our next slide, Mr. Eraser. That's oh. <laughs> and if you'll just tap the screen with your finger. One more time. we got to get this. There we go. Okay, nice. so I drew this little thing um, about three or four years ago on my driver race board. And I started getting this idea of what does, it, what does it look like for a church to be all about Christ in its city? All right, so for, for, for Christ in the city kind of became my mantra, um, which is kind of how I started thinking through ministry and life. And so I drew this, and it kind of got me thinking. So I just I brought this picture back up because it was the beginning of my thinking of along these lines. And it was really just it was last year in my church planning residency at 121 Church that um, my pastor he leads a group called Mission Carolina. And the whole point is how are we collaborating as churches for the sake of, of every man, woman, and child here in the gospel in our city. And so um, we just had a meeting this morning actually here on campus with um, a couple of pastors. And so... Anyways, I started thinking through this, but not understanding how it's going to look, and really started thinking of collaboration. And uh, so, all right, guys. Yeah, I know. It's all Maddie. Um, so, I started drawing this out. So, I, I put Christ in city, and Christ forms uh, the community, which is the church community, okay? But he also forms our, the church community within the city, and so... Matt, once you draw a circle on this community, and maybe just write church somewhere beside it. All right, so this community is the church. He forms it within the city. So it's formed amongst a group of people living and working and playing in their city. All right, but we know that because of the fall, that our city, Derek, if you want to circle city, needs what? Jesus. It, yeah, it needs the mission of God. So it needs a uh, mission, or just you can do that in the circle of gospel. It needs for the, the city needs to see the church, the, this community, living out the mission. Okay? But here's the, the, the comforting thing, is that Christ what? Christ gives us what the mission is. Okay? So Christ forms this community within this city. We know that the city needs the gospel, and so therefore Christ gives what the church is supposed to do. And so the mission of the church is to make disciples and... Uh, it's actually the mission of the church uh, from the mission of God is actually to make disciples of all nations. We know that. And then coupled along with that uh, ties into the cultural mandate of serving the city. Okay? So we know that the city doesn't need our service so much. I mean, it does need uh, you know, social justice type service, ministries of service. But the best service we could do is uh, proclaiming and living the gospel. Okay? So this was um, really how I started thinking. And so you see how, um, draw around this how, the how is going to be a community on mission. So you see there's that word on there in the middle. So to wait, the way that I started seeing for Christ and city, for a church to be about that, we had to see ourselves as a community of people on mission. So the who, Christ forms who, the community, where, the city that needs the mission. So if you want to erase all that for me, and tap it to the next screen. So this was something I drew years ago, started really thinking through what does it look like. And so now as that's been developed and I've you know, come across some new people, starting to think through, well, what is it like? Well, in this class, we so far have gone, we started with a theology of mission, you know, the first, uh, the first uh, three lectures or so. We started discussing what would it look like for, let's, uh, let's change your color. All right, go, go ahead and do it now. Okay, let me, there you go. All right, so we started with being a theology of mission. Then we went to the Great Commission. Then we discussed personal calling. Now the missional action. Nice. Great teamwork. Great teamwork. 
All right, so theology of mission, we looked at the mission of God, right? We looked at the need in North America. Um, but when you talk about the Great Commission, we're talking about disciple-making, right? Mm-hmm. So we, talk, we, we discussed the Great Commission passages, but then we also spent three weeks on making, maturing, and multiplying disciples. So that all kind of fits into the Great Commission. Then we discussed personal calling, all right, assessing what you're called specifically to do. We talked about the apex from Ephesians 4, prophet, priest, king. What is your role going to be in the mission of God? Is it going to be to plant a church, to serve in some other capacity, whichever? And then that leads to missional action. The missional action uh, is the phases we just discussed. The envisioning, the preparing, launching, establishing, and then repeating. That's that missional action. But the result is, at the top here, is we want, we want to see as a gospel movement. I mean, we started with vision. We're going from vision to movement. Okay, so let's erase this. And as he's erasing that, I want to show you, kind of let me bring this over just a hair so it's not up. So this is, uh, this is something that um, Mission Carolina, our church planning network, um, has uh, leaders go through. And I'm going through this right now. And uh, I've actually gone through part of it. But uh, it's called a Cypress Project Training. And basically, it's providing a framework to help uh, missional pastors and leaders Understand what does it take so that every man, woman, child in your city has a repeated opportunity to hear, see, and respond to the gospel. And so these are not steps or phases, okay? Um, but you will see I have the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the bars get smaller as we go down. Not because any of these are less important, but it's really more of you start with having a movement mindset. And that takes you down to a kingdom uh, thinking. Let me go back. All right? And so then you start talking about a movement then you think of kingdom. Then you think through the harvest, lost people. Think of what is a church, what is a disciple, how do we develop leaders, how do we multiply, and then how do we evaluate that scorecard. And so there, these aren't phases in planning a church. These are kind of uh, frameworks. And you'll see as we get through it, it kind of helps you really process um, whenever we do something, whenever we start a new ministry, we're getting ready to plant a church, or we're getting ready to do whatever it is. These are uh, key kind of foundational concepts to keep in mind as you're going through these. Is it, is it, will it help see a gospel movement happen? Does it um, collaborate with other churches uh, in the kingdom? Um, is it intentionally engaging lost people? Is it the purpose is to build up a church from disciples being made? How are we going to develop leaders to be sent out and multiply, and how are we going to evaluate those? So it's kind of building a framework. So I thought it would be healthy for us to go through this today and um, really just kind of break down each one just very quickly. Um, and so each one has a question and then the response. So witnessing a gospel movement such as the book of Acts requires us to ask this question. What would it take for every man, woman, and child in my city to have a repeated opportunity to hear, speak, and respond to the gospel? So what would it take? Do you have any thoughts? Citywide vision. All right. So we'll take a citywide vision. All right. Let's unpack that a little bit more. Well, the first thing I can think of is uh, church the church is working together. Um, yeah. But it would, I think it would require first for the churches to understand their purpose in the Great Commission. Why is the church here? It's not to maintain its buildings and to um, have a fellowship dinner after Sunday night service. Uh, no, it's to make disciples of all the nations. Right. Let me, let me hold the marker. This is one thing that we actually discussed today. Um, what would it take for every man, woman, and child in our city to have repeat opportunity? What's going to take every man, woman, and child inside your church? Yeah. Making disciples. You know? And so that's what it's going to take. So this citywide vision, you start saying, okay, what does it look like? And then we're here in Winston-Salem. What would it look like for the 200 and, what was it, 200 something thousand people who don't know Christ who are here within our area? What would it take for them, for every single one, to have you know opportunity to hear and see and respond to the gospel. Well, this citywide vision is going to involve, and we're actually going to look at that piece uh, next, um, but at the very beginning, it's going to take a movement of God. So that we're talking about movement here. We're, we can't just think one church can do it alone. We have to start thinking, what is it going to take for the church here in the yeah. area to work together and do this? And um, so that's why there's a, a lot now in discussion about collaboration, which takes us to our next point. Oh, oh, oh. You can. Yeah. Oh, oh, go ahead. Advance it to the next slide. Oh, you went too far. We got to um, go back to. Wait, no. There's a. There's a. Look. The slide bottom button, left there. Slide button. Slide button. Go back another. 
today. Okay, here we are. This gone too far. You gone too okay. far, Johnny. Kingdom. <laughs> All right, witnessing a gospel movement such as the Book of Acts requires us to ask who must work together to accomplish this. The church. It's the church. It's the collaboration among the church in the city. Yes, underline the church there. Okay, that's enough underlining. We got it. Everyone understands what we are talking about. All right, so do we often see collaboration among churches like this? No. Not often. So usually it's, well, we'll handle our community, you handle your community, our pastors can be friends, our church members have kids in the same schools, we're nice and we're cordial, we'll even let you use our church van from time to time for an event, but how often do we say, hey, let us infuse into your budget, you know, $50,000 a year to help see a new church, two new churches being planted because you got the people and we have the, the money. You know, what does that look like? Right. Um, and that's part of what we're doing as a network through Mission Carolina. We are bringing churches to the table who are from different denominations and saying, listen, we've got lost people galore around here. 70% are not affiliated with church and have nothing to do with God. So what do we do to reach that 70% here in Winston? Well, my one church of 100 people can't do it. Your one church of 500 people can't do it. Your one church of 5,000 people can't do it because we have hundreds of thousands of people of different you know, backgrounds, languages, and socio socioeconomic statuses. So it's going to take the idea of collaboration um, among the church, multiple here. It's, it's getting, getting over ourselves and being willing to work together. So are you just, just I now really, I really on the edge of screen? Listening, I promise. Yeah, I bet you are. You're going to have to watch this, this again. Really just easily All right, witnessing a gospel movement. It's also going to ask us to think of what the harvest is. Who does this citywide vision prioritize for engaging with the gospel? You know, how often do we plant a church or we see churches, you know, a new church get started and there's 300 people there on launch day? Well, that's, that's phenomenal. But how many of those are people that we've been engaging who were just a few months ago lost without Christ and we've been investing in discipling? So here, especially in our context, we're here in the south, uh, the southern uh, uh, United States, there's churches, there's a lot of church buildings and church names everywhere. So you start a new church, you have a lot of Christians who just aren't finding what they were looking for at their church, and they come to the new one. And then they're there for a few months, and they hop to the next new one. And um, so what, what would it take to see this true gospel movement happen? We have to prioritize and start thinking of the lost people finding new life, not disgruntled church people coming and filling our, our new updated pews, chairs, wherever they are. And so it just it, it, it requires to start asking different kinds of questions. You know, it reorients how you think through your programs. You know, it may even change where you have your worship service. It changes how you do small groups. It alters what you you know do with Sunday school. It changes how you do VBS. Do VBS, but it may not need to be at your church building anymore. It might need to be scattered in four different communities. What if instead of you know a four straight night, you know four or five nights in one week, what if each you know for four weeks? Every Monday night, you were in a different low-income apartment complex hosting VBS for those kids, yeah. and just did it really, really well for the whole day or something like that. You know, so it's, it's it's starting to think differently when you're thinking of the harvest as our priority, and engaging that with the gospel. Um, it, it just kind of changes how you uh, approach ministry, and then you start thinking of the church. You're asking, okay, through what means will this big citywide vision be accomplished? Well, through healthy gospel-centered missional churches. It's it's going to be the the church mobilized. But it's also got to be every man, woman, child in your church. You know, we were discussing this today. Wouldn't it be crazy if you stood in your pulpit, and let's say you have 100 people, your church is 10, 20 years old, and you've got faithful, faithful Christians who have loved the church, who have loved the community, have a heart for Jesus, love Jesus like crazy, want lost people to come into Christ. And what if you stood in your pulpit and said, okay, within the next year, there's 100, 100 at all ages. In the next year, Every single one of you are going to plant your own church. Every single one of you. What What do you think would be the response from the people? You're quack. Yeah. No, 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 no Pastor. We're we're at the we're at the church, right? This This is our church. We don't need to go plant. Um, I saw a video this morning of a uh, he's a pastor from Florida. He's in he was in a, a province in India, and he was uh, doing some training with local pastors there. And he's actually he's doing they were actually more training him than he was doing the training. But um, they were they had this uh, goal. There was this uh, state. Um, they have they kind of kind of like the United States. They have different states, and they had one that had several million people. And they estimated they found the villages, there, all the places that lacked. There was zero gospel presence in this town, in these towns. They identified they needed 961 new churches 
to engage these. And so they start sitting down talking about how they're going to do it, very nonchalantly. So this pastor from Florida who planted a church, and I think they had planted two or three in ten years or something, was, you know, he was, huh? Where at? Uh, it was, um, I cannot remember. It's a town I've never heard of in Florida. Uh, it's close to, is it Naples? Is okay. Naples, Florida? It's oh, close yeah, to Naples. Oh, yeah, that's up to where. Um, so anyways, he was saying, he, he was, you know, they were talking, and, and, and he was trying to grasp what these guys were saying. Like, how in the world are you going to do that? You know, how, how are you going to plant 961 churches in five years? There's only like ten of you around the table. And, and he said one pastor beating the table because he was mad at this, this American pastor wasn't getting it. He's like, no, no, it's only 961 churches. And this, this American pastor's like, that is crazy. Like, we don't, you know, that, that's, that's absurd. Like, the whole United States won't even plant that many in a year kind of thing. And so they finally he started, he started asking questions to get down to it. And the, the Indian pastor saying, no, 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 when every member is a church planter, it's easy to do. And so what they were doing is the membership in your church part of becoming a disciple your discipleship was understanding scripture learning to pray learn what it means to be a church member all these type of things and then learning how to plant a church it was it was natural so when they when when the indian pastor is in front of his congregation now most of these are small mostly house churches in a lot of sense um a few had buildings and whatnot when he stands in front of his congregation and says hey every single one of you want to plant a church in the next year the people in the congregation are saying oh only one you know, it's, it's a completely different mindset. And I think if we're going to see a gospel movement here in the States and in Canada and in, anywhere, it's going to take us really assessing, well, what does it mean to be a church? And that takes us into, well, then what's it mean to be a disciple? You know, because if, if a disciple is now a church planter or understanding that, then, you know, you look at what is the end goal of our efforts for these individuals of our city. Well, the end goal is that we are making, maturing, and multiplying disciples. And we are sending them out to be on mission. And we are saturating the city with the gospel, not through the handful of pastors who are leading, but it's through the church people who are mobilized to do this. And so you're assessing, well, how are we going to prepare and, and equip these disciples to be able to do that on that level and to get over them? And part of their discipleship is getting over their gods of money, getting over the fact that you know, you know, they might need to stop doing some things in order to focus on lost people. You know, one of the stats we were looking at this morning is asking Christians, okay, how, how many non-Christian relationships have you developed in the last year? The most common answer was zero on the, on the statistics. Um, two was the highest that, you know, these the Christian surveyed had made relationships and only like 27% had even had a gospel conversation with those that they had built a relationship with. You're talking extremely low numbers when we start calculating them of us actually, so there's a key part of, of what it means to be a disciple that is uh, missing. So then you talk about leadership. What key component is needed to mobilize my church and those we are collaborating with to accomplish this citywide vision for every man, woman, and child in our city? Well, it's going to take leadership. You know, we talked about leadership pipeline in the assessment. How are you going to go from being lost to leading, right? Well, according to Ephesians 4, it is the, the leadership of the church. It's our role to equip the people for the work of the ministry. So, Matt, whatever church setting you get into in whatever capacity, you're working for a church and you're there your primary job is to equip people for multiplicative gospel-centered ministry in your city. That's your role. And you're doing that along with them and then teaching them how to do it as well. And so it's going to take missionally equipped laity. Why don't you underline these three for me, Matt? Derek, you underline one. The laity, the deacons, and elders or pastors. Right? So, <laughs> there we go. Circle that. <laughs> Specifically the elders. All right, so with these three things, are we leaving anyone out of the church? Nope. Women. Uh, no, I would say that they're, they're definitely <laughs> included in the laity. No, sorry. Oh, Kelly. I thought laity was like pastors and stuff. Not. No, laity is everyone who's not a pastor or a deacon is considered laity. All right, guys. All right. Let me, let me erase this up, and we've got one more. All right. Oh, yeah, two more. How is this possible to accomplish the citywide vision and take it to other cities? We have to think multiplication, not addition. We have to think, just like we talked about in the first phases, how we looked at the numbers, if you know, people would just share the gospel with one, and kind of, you know, if one church planted a church every year and we could reach North America in 15 years, whatever it was. Well, we've got to think multiplying disciples, leaders, and churches who own the losses in their areas. Okay? What is it like for us to own the fact that there are 70% here in Winston-Salem who don't know Christ? What is it like for my church planting friends in Boston to 
only the losses of the 97% who don't know Christ. Or, or in Montreal, where it's the 99.5% who don't know Christ. So we have to think multiplying, not just uh, addition. And it can't happen. You run the numbers, and it actually it can't happen, but we have to do the labor. And then that takes us to the very last one. Well, how will we measure what we value and whether we are effective in our city? So we think in a scorecard, we often think, okay, you know, in a, in a church, what are the things we value? What are some values of a church? Like things that they put a lot of stock in that, hey, this is a mark of our, this is how we show our church is healthy. What are some of these measurements? The youth and children's ministries. Okay. They, like um, Awanas or, or whatever, you know, stuff like that. Okay, so our children's ministry, we've added more and they're growing. What are some other scorecards or some other measurements of success, basically? little board with the numbers that you put in we've got we've got more people sitting in the pews okay we have a bigger budget maybe we have just got done with the building campaign now are more numbers and building buildings and having bigger budgets a bad thing no 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 I would love to have a church building and with people that are filling it up and that's growing and our budget is increasing because then what are we doing with our budget we're pouring it back into multiplying the gospel in our city right so a bigger budget is a fantastic thing if God blesses you, steward it well and not just spend it all on new carpet every five years. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't need to go into amenities in the church, it needs to go to sacrificing for the community. And so how are you evaluating, even you as a leader, your personal, your family, your ministry life, and you're adjusting it as needed? So there's a scorecard that you're evaluating yourself, but you're also evaluating, okay, what is our church value? Do we value our building too much? That, that, you know, if, if, we, if our building burned down, could we still have church next Sunday? Could we still gather as a community next Sunday? For some places, if, if the building burned down, they would say, my church is gone. Wait a second, the hundred people are still, we're still alive. No one was in the building. It burned at night when no one was here. So why, why couldn't we just gather somewhere else, you know? But for some people, if it's tied to there, then it is very much a, uh, um, you know, it's one of the things that they value. And you know, how are you being effective? You know, is the is the percent of lostness always on the rise, and your church is very you know, doing very little, or the collaboration of churches doing little to address that? And so these are the things you are asking, and you are constantly evaluating, but then you are also adjusting. Someone underline adjusting for me, because adjusting is tough. Sometimes adjusting might mean you need to shut your church down and merge with another, because the other church you actually do it better together. And that may be the big adjustment. The adjustment could be you need to get rid of some of your elders because they're leading your church into a very self-centered focus. And they're not focused on multiplication. They're focused on the building or the budget or something else. Um, it could be slight adjustments. Hey, we need to not meet on Sunday morning. We need to meet Sunday night. Okay, why? Well, that, it fits the, the community that we're in. It just fits. And we would have more participation with the community if we were doing things on Sunday night. Well, then make that adjustment. All right? Um, so there, there's different things that we have to be willing to adjust and do. But it all comes with what kind of a scorecard, and having a healthy scorecard um, is key. And so we think through movement, kingdom, harvest, church, disciple, evolution, multiplication, scorecard. All of these things are kind of surrounding, which really give us a vision that drives your church's passion and mission. That's what the whole kingdom uh, through um, a scorecard idea is. It's really just grasping a bigger picture, bigger vision, that is always driving. It's, it's, that, it's like the engine. It's the operating system of your church. Okay? It is driving what your church, where your heart, for, you know, your heart for the community, your passion, and what you do with that. All right? So that's kind of how this helps. Now, what you see, we go back to our, our pyramid from the beginning. And so we start, we, we start with the theology of mission. We discuss the Great Commission, making, maturing, and multiplying disciples. We're looking at you and your personal calling. Then what are you going to do with it as far as the phases of a church plant? Are, is this all lead to what we want to see is a gospel movement and we do this for the glory of Christ and for the sake of the city okay so this, that, that, that top piece has kind of become my personal mantra um, am I doing in, in, in the gospel community that I lead as part of my church do we do it for the glory of Christ and for the benefit of those who are around us so we're trying to be a benefit and a uh, doing things for the sake of the lost people that we are interacting with um, there in the Wake Forest area so any any concluding thoughts? It all sounds good, but in reality, there's a lot behind it. Oh yeah. And I know, and I think about uh, the church I'm at right now, and just I mean, just as an example, the thought of saying, 
let's let's do Sunday night instead of Sunday morning. I, I mean, you'd, you'd have a better chance of you know. Yeah. I mean, and and you know that that may not be an adjustment to make right, right. now. You know. Um, oh, and the, I mean, you know, I'm not saying that's what's going to happen, but I just think of some churches they're just so they're just so stuck. Right. Man. But if but if your people started getting a bigger kingdom movement mindset, and you're, and, and I think this. I think this list even affects your, affects your preaching and how you disciple. Mm -hmm. So if you're discipling people from the beginning to think that they can be a church planter and that that is their role as a great commission, then these things are coming natural to that person. Yeah. If you take a person who has never been brought up or discipled in that way, it's going to take a lot of time. And your sermons will now start to shift a little bit to where you're thinking, okay, well, if I'm preaching from the book of James and it's talking about you know taking care of the widows and orphans, well, that's a little bit bigger than just, you know, simple faith or whatever like that's actually action well is that part of something bigger how can we work alongside of the churches to see no orphans in our t in our city well that's 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 you know, you're talking about kingdom at that point how are we going to partner and collaborate um all for the end goal is let's, let's see a gospel movement every man woman child um, having repeat opportunity to hear see and respond to the gospel so well gentlemen i hope that was uh beneficial and uh that concludes our Last and final lecture of talking about going from a vision to a movement.